Hello, everyone. Welcome back to the Weekend Charts. Charlie Bellello here. I'm your host. And as always, I'm going to run through some of the most important charts and themes we're seeing today. A lot to discuss with you today. So stick around to the end. If you're watching this on YouTube, hit that subscribe button for more content just like it. So what are we going to be discussing today? Number one, here comes the FOMO. A lot of fear of missing out going on. Why is that? Well, because you have assets that are going parabolic. And whenever that happens, FOMO takes hold. March 2009, can't believe it, but it's been 15 years now since that March 2009 low. Digital and physical gold rush going on. Bitcoin, regular gold, all both hitting all-time highs. Spending like drunken sailors. Who's doing that? Well, of course, the U.S. federal government. Rising household debt burden. We'll dig into that in terms of mortgage debt, non-mortgage debt. Interesting things going on there. Jobs report. Now we have 38 consecutive months of jobs growth. Uh, so longest streak we've seen in some time. Labor market is loosening. And finally, we end with something positive, as always, and that's rising wages and falling inflation. So let's dig into FOMO. Here it comes. Why is it coming? Well, because things are going parabolic. And in the equity market, number one would, of course, be NVIDIA just extending its gains, just crazy gains year to date, 87% now We're through March 7th. Uh, leading all stocks in the S&P of 500 by a wide margin. You got Meta there at 45%. What you'll notice here, though, growing divergence between NVIDIA and the rest of what I'm calling the enormous eight here. So I'm including Netflix. A lot of people talk about the Magnificent Seven. I'm adding in Netflix. But now we have Tesla down 28%, Apple down 12%, Google down 4%. And NVIDIA up 87%. Overall, S&P 500 up 8%. Very strong return through March 7th. If, if you remember, strategists were expecting a 2% gain for the entire year. So we're well above that. And it's only March 7th. Uh, so pretty incredible. And when things like this happen, when you have something like NVIDIA running up as fast as, it, as it's going, you tend to have people start to chase and FOMO take over. So you have to be mindful of that. One cautionary thing I would hear would say in terms of expecting this to continue, we have a very low percentage of stocks in the S&P 500 outperforming the actual index. So here is a chart going back to 1994, 24% over the past year. That's the lowest on record with data going back to 1994. You got to go back to 1999 to uh, see the previous low. If you remember, that was kind of the period where we transitioned from large mega cap tech outperformance to other areas of the market. So we'll, we'll look back on this in a year and see if this was some type of signal, but interesting to see very few stocks outperforming the index over the past year. And Nvidia being one of the reasons why just the huge outsized gains, they are dominating everything else. We talk about all time highs and FOMO. This is an important one because media is mentioning all time highs all the time. Why are they doing that? Because we've already hit 16 year to date and it's only March 7th. And if this were to continue at the current pace, and of course that's not likely, it would surpass the record from 1995, which was 77 all time highs. So just an incredible start to the year for the S&P 500. And most people weren't predicting that. If we look at sectors, semiconductors last 10 years up 10 X. So 10 bagger in 10 years for the semiconductor, uh, SOX ETF here, way outperforming everything else. NASDAQ 100's had a great 10 years and it's only up 426%. S&P 500, 226%. And gold, which we're going to talk about in a little bit, up 54% over the last 10 years. Obviously, nothing compared to these other asset classes. Now, if we look at semis relative to the S&P 500, highest level this week since July 2000. Of course, 2000 was the peak. In terms of tech, in terms of semiconductor, you got a three-year bear market, follow that peak. Uh, so interesting to see we're back to that level today. And you can just see a huge parabolic move higher over the past year or so in terms of semiconductors relative to the broad market. And what a run it's been over the past few years. Really started in 2020. Uh, we had that brief bear market there in 2022. But since then, taking off NVIDIA, but it's not just NVIDIA, AMD, many other issues as well in the top performing stocks in the S&P 500 in that semiconductors. I've said it's become kind of the new oil semiconductor shifts in terms of the way investors are looking at this. It's going to power the future in terms of AI. The question, of course, 
is have expectations gotten too high? This is one way to look at this. This really surprised me. NVIDIA market cap is approaching Apple. 10 years ago, Apple had 47 times the market cap of NVIDIA. Five years ago, nine times larger. Even a year ago, Apple was still four times larger, but today only 1.1 times larger than NVIDIA. And Apple has 100 billion in terms of net income, highest of any company. Uh, this is just incredible. Of course, NVIDIA's net income has gone up a lot, but nowhere near Apple's, even with the growth expectations over the next year, not going to come close to that $100 billion mark. Uh, but you can clearly see how high investor expectations are, let's say, for the next 10 years for NVIDIA. The question is, are they going to meet those expectations? This is a crazy one. I like to do this with Tesla as well, because we see at times a huge divergence between the price returns and actual growth uh, in fundamentals. And we talked about this a lot in 2020 and 2021 with Tesla. And the interesting thing that's going on with NVIDIA this year so far is that it's up 87%, but the full year revenue growth expectation for NVIDIA is 81%. So we've already exceeded that in terms of price. So the question is, is this just front running, you know, pulling forward returns, even if we hit that big number, and that would be, of course, a big number, 81%. Is this pulling for forward returns? Or is NVIDIA going to continue to surprise to the upside? That's what it's been doing, of course. But just one way to look at how far expectations have gone with NVIDIA. Another way of illustrating this would be to look at a forward price to sales ratio. So taking the current price of NVIDIA and dividing it by expected sales over the next year. I don't like to do this in general because expectations can be wildly off, but with something that's growing as quickly as Nvidia, it's a good way to kind of gauge this. And you can see, even though obviously it's, it's uh, sales are expected to be much higher, you can see the prices are going up even faster than that uh, expected growth. So here, almost 18 times forward price to sales, very, very high, obviously for a company that's 2.3 trillion. We've never seen, of course, anything like this in terms of the growth rate or these types of numbers. So we're in char uncharted territory all around, but this just gives you an idea how high expectations are for Nvidia today. And if we look at overall sentiment, what was interesting up until this point this year is we had, we had pretty high sentiment at one point in December, and then to start the year, it actually dropped down which was interesting because the market had a pretty strong start to the year, but now it's starting to come back. So this is looking at the spread between bulls and bears in terms of this AAII sentiment poll. They do it every week asking investors, what's your expectation for the S&P 500 over the next six months? Are you bullish, bearish, or neutral? And now we're up to a 30% spread where bulls are 30% higher than bears. The average over the last 10 years is 2% higher. So sentiment starting to get more bullish. You can see what this dip back here last October when the market had a correction, you can see bears outnumbered bulls by a good amount. Well, now that's flipped. People getting more excited, even though prices are rising at a rapid pace. That's always the case. As an investor, you want to make sure you're not doing this. You're doing the opposite. What's one way to do that? It's to have someone keeping a check on your emotions. We try to do that at Creative Planning. If you're looking for an advisor, you want a second look on your portfolio, take a look at the show notes. I have a link in there so you can click on and set up a call, set up a meeting. We're in all 50 states. We have over 100,000 clients, 300 billion in assets under management and advisement. We're here to help with all of these things. Tax season coming up. We do tax returns, estate planning, everything all in-house. And uh, so reach out. We're here to help. We're happy to help you with anything in terms of investment management, planning, legal, tax, everything in between, businesses as well. So number two, March 2009 low, 15 year anniversary. This is kind of crazy. It sneaked, <laughs> it really snuck up on me. I can't believe, I remember the March 2009 low very vividly, and now it's been 15 years, 923% return since then. What does that break, break down to annualize? 16.7% per year over 15 year period. Nobody thought that was going to happen back in March, 2009. Shows you uh, the market is often doing <laughs> surprising and doing things that no one thought was possible. And this is just yet another example of that. But 
even more fascinating this than this unbelievable return which is obviously way higher than the average return which is around 10 percent per year uh, for the s p 500 historically is the fact that even if you bought at the peak before this bear market this was the worst bear market we, we had since the great depression the s p 500 was down 57 percent and even if you bought at the peak in october 2007 before this you would actually today still be up 357 plus percent 9.7 percent annualized or total return since then and that's a function of a few different things obviously the huge gains in the last decade but it's also a function of just time in the market is more important than timing the market so as your holding period goes up it becomes less and less important what your particular entry point is and that's particularly true this is showing just a snapshot shot of a, a lump sum investment but if you were dollar cost averaging during this period you would have been buying during all of this period where the market was down below its high right so you would have been averaging in at a lower price so anyone who has a 401k or ira and you're adding to it every year well that makes that entry point less and less import important so just having a long-term horizon means that you don't have to pick that march 2009 low in order to succeed as an investor but just keep expectations in check next 15 years I would be shocked if we came anywhere near the 16.7%. Why is that? Because there's mean reversion in markets. And when you have an abnormal return over this period or any period, you shouldn't expect that to continue. So keep expectations in check. Definitely appreciate the gains that we've had over the past 15 years, but don't think that's likely to be repeatable in the next 15. So number three here, digital and physical gold, both hitting all-time highs. So Bitcoin, been a while, but new milestone here. We hit 69,000, then 70,000. Last milestones were in November 2021. You can see here this crazy uh, period where Bitcoin crossed above 20,000, then proceeded to go all the way from 20,000 to uh, 68,000 in a very short period of time. Then it had that huge correction, huge bear market, finally recovered, and this week hitting 69,000 and 70,000. If we talk about one of the major reasons for the recent rush higher, we have to put this at the top of the list, would be the inflows into Bitcoin ETFs. Retail investors seem to be embracing these products. They, they, it was said that they were waiting for them in order to invest. A lot of people weren't comfortable with buying Bitcoin directly. They wanted to buy an ETF, particularly in their retirement accounts and other accounts. And so we're seeing the inflows here one two three four five straight weeks and this is before this week it's probably going to be a huge inflow this week as well with those record highs and if we look at the total assets of the top 10 uh bitcoin spot etfs here 48 billion entering the week this crossed well above 50 billion this week and so just to give you an idea gold etf gld has around 55 billion in assets so very quickly here coming close to matching that and perhaps I'll have updated data next week. Perhaps we even surpass that this week. So what's the catch with Bitcoin? Well, anyone who's coming in today, be very aware of what this asset class is capable of. Everyone wants to focus on the upside. You have to look at the downside and nothing with big upside has doesn't have big downside from time to time. And these are a list of the major corrections you can see here. The last one, 78% decline and when you have that large of a decline, you need a huge advance in order to get back to even. And that's what's happened here. 346% gain uh, since that low in November, 2022, 846 days it took to get back to a new high. Just be cognizant of that. You're going to see more corrections. This idea that it's just going to go up forever is absolute nonsense. Anyone telling you that uh, just run in the other direction and just look at the change in sentiment go back to november 2022 and go back to what people were saying about crypto about bitcoin that was right after ftx had that huge failure and people were down on the asset class they were saying this is uh done and of course sentiment changed and now we have go back fast forward to today the asset class is 350 percent higher than back then and people are more bullish so sentiment regardless of what you're talking about is always dictated by price and no different than the stock market 
you don't want to be more bullish on this asset class today than when it was at 15,000. That doesn't make any sense whatsoever, regardless of your opinion of Bitcoin. So Bitcoin, not the only thing hitting all-time highs this week. Gold as well. You can see here gold priced in US dollars. Uh, a, a cyclical asset class for sure is gold. And if we talk about gold and we talk about the stock market, well, both of them have had tremendous long cycles. Gold, of course, peaked in early 1980s after a parabolic runoff and then didn't hit a new all-time high for over 20 years after that had suffered its longest drawdown, biggest drawdown and longest correction in history. After it finally got back to new highs, it had a huge run once again, but peaked in 2011, had another decade of nothing and a big drawdown. And 2020, when COVID hit, gold hit an all-time high. Then it traded sideways for a few years, and now it's back at an all-time high again. You can see here, hits that new high, and then it just continues higher here over, over this week. And interestingly, it's only up around 5% year-to-date. Uh, S&P 500, as we said, is up 8%, so still trailing that. And uh, what I found most interesting is the GLD ETF is back at an all-time high, and bonds are still in an 11% drawdown. Why that's interesting to me is they both had bear markets begin in August 2020. And really, uh, the driver of that is that gold does, gold does not like higher interest rates, and particularly higher real interest rates. And so when interest rates bottomed around that point in 2020, they had nowhere to go but up. They definitely did go up a lot over that period of time. But What's driving gold over the past few months higher? Well, int real interest rates are falling again. You can see that here in the chart. It doesn't look like much, but starting to fall again. And it seems to be the expectation, at least based on the price action in gold, that real interest rates are going to continue to fall. We'll see if that's uh, uh, that occurs. And maybe that's coinciding with the expectations of the Fed cutting interest rates. And we'll talk about that in a little bit. So what is the big reason driving Bitcoin and gold higher. To me, number one, these are story asset classes. They trade on the prevailing nar narrative and story. And a big part of that is the rising US government spending, rising national debt, and this idea that eventually that's going to lead to a debasement of the dollar and that's going to lead to more inflation to come. So that, to me, that's the big backdrop driving this. And you can see here, the story has been just an unrelenting increase in terms of U.S. government spending. I'm comparing it here to overall consumer prices since the year 2000, 243% increase in U.S. federal government spending, 83% increase in consumer prices. So they're not anywhere near keeping, just keeping pace with inflation in terms of the increases in spending. They're way exceeding it. And I looked at this on an annual basis. They're more than doubling the rate of spending versus what CPI would dictate. So huge, huge increase in government spending and huge, huge increase in government debt. And the problem, as we said, when interest rates are low, that doesn't seem to be a problem at all. But with higher interest rates, that quickly becomes more and more of a problem. And now we have annualized interest payments on government debt crossing above $1 trillion for the first time. And you can see it was only a few years ago we were at 500 billion, so doubling in a very short period of time because interest rates really rising, especially short-term interest rates and a lot of that government debt, as we've talked about in 2020, they did not term it out. They did not do the smart thing and borrow 20 years, 30 years, or even issue. Some people were talking at the time about 100-year bonds. They should have done that. They didn't do that. And so all of that short-term debt as it matures, while well, it's maturing and they're issuing new debt at a higher uh, higher interest rates, which leads to higher interest payments. And of course, the national debt itself is going up as well. So if we look at interest payments as a percentage of nominal GDP, gone up a huge amount over the past few years, 2.5% to 3.7%. That's the biggest short-term increase we've seen in history. This is the highest level since the second quarter of 1999. And the expectation if you look at the uh, Congressional Budget Office or anyone who 
who looks at, at projecting these things over time, the expectation is this is going to continue to rise as a percent of nominal GDP. So it's going to become a, a bigger and bigger portion of the budget, the federal budget and of our economy, just paying interest payments on national debt. And so what's, uh, what's going on with that national debt? Well, it continues to rise at an unbelievably rapid pace. So uh, we started the year at $34 trillion, uh, and through two months, this is through the end of February, we're at $34 trillion, $470 billion. So we've added $470 billion in just two months, which is kind of just unbelievable in terms of the increase there. And uh, that spending going to all different pay places, interest payments on that debt being uh, just one of them. Another area that's going, of course, is uh, in terms of the uh, things like the manufacturing bill that they passed, the Inflation uh, Reduction Act, so-called. Uh, and so you're seeing the spending here uh, reflected here, $225 billion in, uh, over the past year in manufacturing construct construction spending. That's a record high. In the past two years, it's increased 130%. So you talk about economic growth, talk about GDP. You can't separate this from the massive amount of fiscal stimulus that's still going on. And so we're going to find out if this ever abates, but what is debt and what is growth in terms of the economy? What's the what's really driving it? Is it this massive increase in terms of spending or is it the real economy? Is it, is it increases in productivity? It's very hard to decipher that when we're running uh, these types of increases in national debt. So interesting juxtaposition here though is looking at manufacturing pmi so well, while we're building out this manufacturing capacity within the us for semiconductor chips auto uh, auto plants and and things like that what we're not seeing yet is manufacturers saying uh, this is a good environment in terms of producing manufacturing economy is still in contraction this is 16 straight months for this ism survey that's the longest down streak we've seen since 2000, 2001. And that was during a recession. We had a recession in 2001. So very unusual to see manufacturing down in the doldrums for this long. As, we've, as, we, as I've said before, though, you can't just look at manufacturing in terms of the U.S. economy anymore. It's uh, about, I'd say, 11% of the economy in terms of the contribution to GDP. So the service sector way, way more important without the service sector having a downturn, uh, you're not going to enter a recession. So just an interesting to see that we're having this huge manufacturing construction boom, but we're not yet seeing any type of boom in terms of the actual manufacturing economy. So number five, I want to talk about rising household debt burden that's going on here. And this is a chart looking at non-mortgage debt and mortgage debt. And interesting here, we have non-mortgage debt hitting a record of 573 billion in January. But the more fascinating thing is that it's close to surpassing mortgage debt, which is at 578 billion. That's never happened before. Historically, mortgage debt has been way higher in terms of the interest payments that people are paying. And so why have interest payments on non-mortgage debt skyrocketed in recent years while mortgage debt has only gone up uh, more gradually? Well, it's because the interest rate on mortgages is fixed. The interest rate on a lot of non-mortgage debt is floating. And with the increases in interest rates, well, people with fixed mate rate mortgages, they're not paying a higher rate. So it's just the people that are have moved or buying new houses. And that's the reason for the inter higher interest payments. Uh, whereas on the non-mortgage side, we're seeing record highs in terms of things like credit card debt. So I think this chart really illustrates that pretty well here. Credit card interest rate, 21 and a half percent. It's a record high looking back historically in the US. And we have the effective mortgage rate of 3.8%. So effective means what what are people paying on average? So we know currently mortgage rates are around 7%, but if we look at what people are actually paying, the effective rate is 3.8%. And yes, that's gone up a little bit, but not very much. And the reason for that is many people are staying put, they're locked in this low interest rate mortgage, and they have no interest in moving uh, before mortgage rates come back down. So for now, this is an interesting thing where 
non-mortgage debt is really rising at a much faster pace. You can see that also in this chart here. And this is kind of comforting in a way because if you're looking at the percentage of interest payments as a share of U.S. total household income, yes, it's going up. So that debt burden is going up in terms of both mortgage debt and non-mortgage debt. But overall, if you look at the combination of the two, we're at 4.9%. And that's nowhere near where we were in December 2007 before the financial crisis. We were at 7.4%. So yes, we're at the highest level since 2011, but we're still well below where we were in most of the 2000s and 1990s. So U.S. consumer, even though worse position, let's say, in terms of debt than they were a few years ago, particularly non-mortgage debt, if, if we compare it to the period before that, if we look at the 90s or 2000s, still a ways to go before we get to that point. And if we look at U.S. consumer credit, we can see here, overall, it's only now increased 2.5% over the last year. It was kind of worrying in 2022 when we were seeing this huge spike higher, but that's definitely moderated as inflation has come down. People have moderated their use of credit. I think a big part of this is also mortgage debt, the lack of it uh, uh, coming uh, coming out in the last couple of years due to the housing market slowdown. Uh, but overall, people not taking on a huge amount of debt, but within the credit card space, still increasing at a pretty rapid pace, up 14.5% over the last year. So it's really bifurcated in terms of who's experiencing the pain. Well, we have, on the one hand, the people with credit card debt, they're ex definitely experiencing the pain because they have floating rate debt for record high in interest rates. And you can see here, delinquency is starting to rise here, 3.1% highest since 2011. The other side, the side that's actually experiencing good things during this higher interest rate period is people who locked in low interest rate mortgages. They don't have credit card debt. And they actually have savings accounts where they're actually earning a higher rate of savings uh, on, on their cash. So you have two different sides here. And for now, it's just hitting really those the hardest with credit card debt or people with a lot of auto loans or looking to buy something, a, a new auto loan at eight or 9% interest rates. So those people, but the people who locked in low rates uh, for in 2020 and 2021, and for most people, the house is the biggest asset and it's the biggest uh, debt that they have. And a lot of people, this is really was underappreciated uh, how much of an impact this would have. A lot of people just locked in that low mortgage rate and for now, they're not moving anywhere. So let's talk about the jobs report. 38 consecutive months now with jobs growth, you can see here on the chart. And the period before the uh, 2020 uh, downturn, uh, which was short-lived, it was 100 consecutive months. That was by far the longest in history. But other than that, you can see here 46, 48, 45, uh, kind of the limit in terms of, of jobs growth. We're at 38, so certainly could continue. And since we did 100, there's no, no reason to say we can't go a few more years of having jobs growth. And I'll talk about in a bit why another reason why that's possible but the actual report 275,000 jobs people were expecting 190 so better than expectations but we had downward revisions and this is a huge thing to note with the jobs report there's a massive re revision so you shouldn't put any weight on that particular monthly number uh, because of it could be revised much lower or higher the following month so you should just be really looking at the trend in terms of jobs and the prior month was revised from 353,000 all the way down to 229,000. And then this could still be revised months from now. So uh, just be careful assigning too much weight to the payroll report, never a good idea. And if we look at where the jobs are coming from, healthcare, number one, once again. So we've talked about massive shortage in terms of healthcare. This is a secular trend. This is gonna continue for years and years and years. We just need way more healthcare workers. So that is expected to continue. Leisure and hospitality, this is, we talked about in 2020, a lot of people leaving that area, they couldn't get them to come back to work and slowly but surely they're getting people to come back in terms of restaurants, hotels, bars, all of that stuff. So number two there. And government, this was a persistent theme throughout all, throughout all of last year. Number three in terms of job creation, 52,000. And unemployment rate, 3.9%, that's the highest we've seen since January, 2022. The expectation was for 3.7%. So 
a little bit worse than expected. So dipping up to 3.9%. Remember last year we hit the lowest level since 1969 at 3.4%. And uh, so people are going to be watching this obviously pretty closely to see if it crosses above 4% uh, because a rising unemployment rate, of course, tends to be associated with a contraction. And of course, the Federal Reserve is watching this very closely because this is the other mandate of the Fed other than inflation is maximum employment. And what you're seeing here is starting to trend in the other direction. But we'll talk about the Fed in a little bit in expectations. If we look at the unemployment rate, it's still well below, let's say the historical average below 4%, 25 consecutive months. That's the longest streak below 4% since the late 1960s. So very, very unusual for the unemployment rate to stay this low for this long. And a big driver of that was the extreme labor market tightness that we saw following COVID, obviously the effect of the stimulus payments, other factors, people just didn't come back to work, but month by month, they're coming back and particularly prime age workers. So if we look at 25 to 54 year olds here, we have the labor force, force participation rate at 83.5%. That's the highest we've seen since May, 2002. Who isn't coming back and why is the overall participation rate not at the highest level since then? Well, it's older workers. This is 55 and older here. You could see pre-COVID, they were at 40.3% in terms of the participation rate. And now we're at 38.5% does not appear to be rising. And this has been a trend here where we're seeing older workers, they started retiring or early in 2020, and that's really continued. You had a little bit of a reversal in 2022 when inflation was really spiking and you had the stock market going down. But after 2023 and housing prices and stock prices hitting record highs, we have people early retiring again. So that leaves a gap, right? So you have people retiring, let's say at 58 or 59 or 60, they're not coming back into the labor force. That leaves a gap in terms of you have a shortage in terms of the supply of labor. And this is just comparing what we were doing pre-COVID in terms of the trend, where the total number of jobs would be versus the actual. And there's still a 4 million uh, job gap there between the actual and the pre-COVID trend, which to me means perhaps we could still see uh, some more job gains over the next year. That wouldn't be unheard of. And we'll talk about job openings in a little bit. But in terms of what the Fed expectations are, jobs report had really no impact on expectations. Market was expecting four Fed cuts going into the meeting with the first cut in uh, going into the payroll report with the first cut happening in June. And they expected the same after the jobs report. So really no change Four cuts. Of course, the Fed is projecting three cuts. Uh, so we'll see what happens uh, between now and then these numbers are going to change a lot. Of course, we have the CPI reports uh, coming as well. And, you know, Powell, in all his statements, he, he seems to be saying, yes, we're likely to cut at some point this year. Interest rates have likely peaked, uh, but we're in no rush to get started. And June seems to be the expectation that people are centered around. But of course, uh, that could change as the data change. So let's talk about the labor market lo loosening here. If we got new data on the quits rate, this is the percentage of workers quitting their job. And it was hitting a record high of 3% a few years ago. Now we're down to 2.1%, so lowest we've seen since August 2020. And this is a big sign of loosening in the labor market because if workers are experiencing a tight labor market, if it's easy to get a new job, a lot of job openings, well, they're more likely to quit their jobs and think that they could go to a different job, a better job, higher pay. Uh, but the percentage of them doing that is going down. So that seems to be a sign that the labor market is loosening. If we look at actual job openings, that's been trending down for a while. Uh, the expectation is this will likely continue throughout the year. And if we look at non-farm payrolls on a year over year basis, up 1.8%, this is just looking at total jobs. You can see here, just a steady downward trend. This is the lowest growth rate since March, 2021. So still adding jobs. Uh, but at a much slower pace than we were doing before, which is a sign that the labor market is loosening. And that's a good thing. People are coming back to work. We're filling these healthcare jobs, leisure and hospitality jobs uh, that were causing a lot of problems from labor shortages there. So as time goes on, we fill that gap. 
uh, that's definitely good news. So I want to end with something positive, as we always do, rising wages, falling inflation. So we got the average hourly earnings number, again, here above 4%. This is the 32nd consecutive month where we've increased hourly earnings on a year-over-year -year basis above 4%. Just pretty remarkable here. So 4.3% increase in hourly earnings. And this is for February. And what's the expectation for February CPI? It hasn't come out yet, but the expectation from the Cleveland Fed, they've been pretty good at predicting this, 3.1%. So we have that spread 4.3% in terms of your increase in your wages, 3.1% in terms of inflation. And that spread is great news. You want to have a positive spread. That'll be a 10 straight month if it happens, if we get this 3.1% 10 straight month where wages have outpaced inflation. And if we look at Truflation, which does their own methodology calculating what the U.S. inflation rate is, the news is even better because they're saying actually the inflation rate is not 3%, but it's 1.6% over the past year. So depending on your view, you might say it's higher or lower than that 3%. But regardless, if wages are outpacing inflation, that's good news. And that continues to be the biggest driver of prosperity for any nation. And so we want to see that continue. Hopefully it does. With that, we'll end it right there. Have a great weekend, everyone. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time on The Weekend Charts.